blackiron79.com and I am back here with another video for you guys. So I just picked a couple hands, two hands from NL2 that I want to go over today. They're both six max and the reason I wanted to put these two hands together in one video is because these two hands sort of in a nutshell uh, in my opinion are how you beat this stake in particular. Um, it's all about, uh, as I talked about in my How to Crush the Micro series, uh, Micro Stakes series, sorry, uh, I, there's a part one, two, three, and four for that. You can go check that out. The most important keys to success, especially at this stake and in L5 as well, is getting the most out of your big hands and getting away cheaply uh, when you have the second best hand. So I think I have two really, really good uh, examples of that set up here, so I'm going to go over those briefly in this video. So first hand here, I've got uh, pocket fives on the button. Uh, once again, uh, this is NL2, uh, one cent, two cent, six max. And um, as I always say, going around the table, you know, there's always going to be a reason I'm at the table. Um, and we can see here with the villain 49 and villain 47 that we have two clear, clear reasons to be at the table and, and also villain three as well. This is NL2. Uh, there, you know, you guys uh, should be playing with bad players all the time. If, if there's not players like this that are, you know, huge fish at your tables, then you shouldn't be on that table, basically. If your goal is to crush the micro six. If you want to play with regs all day and have a little tiny little win rate, then, you know, that's the choice that you're making by uh, staying on those tables. So... Uh, I'll just go over the HUD real quick, uh, just for anyone who has not seen any of my videos before. So we'll use this uh, villain one here. So the 49 is the number of hands. 58 is the number of hands that he plays. 17 is the percentage of hands that he raises preflop. And 1 is the postflop aggression factor. Uh, you can kind of see on the second round there we have fold to seal, fold to 3 bet, 3 bet, all that kind of stuff. All And the uh, the last two rows are postflop stats. I'll, you, I'll refer to that stuff uh, if it's applicable in either of these hands. Um, so let's get right into this. Uh, we do have a poster, it should be noted. Uh, you know, bad players posting out of position, nothing new. So we'll see what happens here. So, uh, you know, one of the other players we have marked as a bad player, uh, does we does best, <laughs> and limps. Uh, he's a 33, so, uh, th or 30 slash 3, I should say. So he's limping pretty much all the time. So um, he does that. The other dude who uh, posted, he checks... Uh, his blinds, uh, and then we have a raise from a somewhat uh, uh, sort of reasonable looking reg. I mean, there's still a, uh, the gap between his VPIP and PFR is still quite a bit too much for, I would say it's too much. Uh, it should be closer to uh, two or three points the gap rather than um, uh, nine, as we, as we see here. And also his post-flop aggression is insanely low at one. Uh, but he looks to be somewhat like a reasonable player. He's somewhat tight and somewhat aggressive preflop. And so he decides to raise it up here. Now, he could be isolating these two limpers with quite a wide range, but I don't really think it makes a whole lot of sense um, um, to just three bet in this spot. And I, I think I may have talked about this before, but at NL2, my my three bet is, te is, is often a lot lower. I mean, I don't want to say a lot lower, but it, it's lower in general uh, than at higher stakes because I don't really see the point in just, you know, three betting it in a spot like this all the time and trying to take it down. And the main reason is, guys, you're playing against such terrible, terrible players at, at this stake. And I mean, look at the guys on this table. I mean, there's not one decent player on this table. Um, there is just so much more value in just seeing a flop and hitting your set and stacking them all. I mean, so the whole point about, you know, ramping up the preflop aggression at higher stakes, I'm really talking about NL10, NL, or, actually, I'm talking more about NL25, especially NL50. The reason why you see a lot of uh, ramped up aggression there with the three betting and the four betting is because the edges are a lot smaller post-flop. Whereas in a game like this, which is just full of loose, passive, terrible players, I mean, it, there's just more value in seeing a flop, especially with a hand like this. If you've got a big value hand, of course, sure. You know, if you've got pocket kings here, of course, three bet, definitely, because you know they're going to call um, a lot of the time, and, and it's just better to, to get more money in the pot. But in a spot like this, there's no point in, uh, you know, making a quote-unquote light three bet in this spot. Um, I would much rather just uh, flat and let all these bad players uh, come and uh, join the party. 
Um, and unfortunately, most of them actually fold. And uh, it's just the um, the uh, somewhat like a reg player that uh, we were talking about before that calls. Um, as you can see, we hit our set, which obviously is incredible. That's uh, that's the whole point uh, here of why we're calling. Um, and he makes a two-thirds pot C bet. So, you know, as I've talked about many times, I talk about, you know, especially in my first book, Crushing the Micro Stakes, and on my blog a lot, is that we really need to be fast playing your big hands at the, at the lowest stakes here. Um, you should absolutely never be, uh, be slow playing against uh, players like this because they, all of these players at these stakes, what do they like to do? Call. So why would you ever slow play a big hand? It just logically makes no sense at all. So I am always just raising here, usually making about three times the raise. Um, Any calls, of course. So really all this does, the whole point here is we're, we're looking to stack him. I mean, one of the, so as I said at the top of this video, one of the uh, most important points, uh, one of the two uh, keys to success at NL2, NL5 especially, getting the most from your big hands, and of course in the next hand I'll talk about getting away. So, but, the, you know, that's the whole point of fast playing, getting more money in the pot, because our goal is to get all of his money. Like, I've said this before, if you got a hand like this, um, or if you're in some sort of a cooler spot where, you know, you've got aces and the other guy's got queens or something like that, and it's a low board, if that guy's got any money left in his stack... At the end of the hand, you butchered the hands. You have to stack these guys all the time at these stakes. It's, you know, if if you want a big win rate, you know, and really this this is just a fundamental uh, of the game as well is uh, getting the most out of uh, you know your big hands against bad players. And honestly, guys, every player at these stakes is, you know, they're not they're not very good. Let's put it that way. I don't want to, you know, say they're terrible or something. But even the regs, but. <laughs> I mean, most of them are. I mean, and the regs are beginners. I mean, they're, they're not good at getting away from, you know, big over pairs and stuff like that. So just fast play your big hands. So uh, he calls. We get a jack on the turn. It's whatever. I mean, we got the set. It, it just doesn't matter. If the guy happens to have pocket jacks, then we lose, whatever. But there's so many other hands you can have, um, you know, if he happens to have set over set or something. But it is, it's such a, a, a low probability of that kind of thing happening so our goal is just absolutely get all the money in always 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 here uh so he checks to us what do we do bet never like i said never slow play there's absolutely no point it's just no point whatsoever uh so we bet here we bet i don't know like what is that two-thirds pot or something it's okay whatever um there's so much in the pot at this point that you can kind of just, uh, I don't really ever do the math in this spot and say, okay, well, how much do I have to bet here so that it's a pot size bet on the river? I just know that basically this amount, two thirds, um, is going to set up a, you know, uh, a bet on the river so that, you know, my bet is basically less than the pot on, on the river, the, the all in bet, the all in bet that I make on the river or that he makes is going to be less than the pot basically. Uh, but in this case, he just shoves, and that just makes it super easy. Um, just hit the call button as quick as you possibly can and get all the money in. Uh, it's very unlikely he has a four in his hand. It's very unlikely that he that he hit backdoor clubs, but you never know with these stakes. And he had the old aces. So, um, so you know, that's example number one against a sort of typical regular, I guess, at, at NL2. Uh, these guys can't fold the races. They're kings. That you know, you need to be stacking these guys all the time. If this guy had any money left in his in his stack, you've butchered the hand, basically. <laughs> so I want to go into uh, hand number two here, though. And this is a hand where we're going to lose the least. So I'm talking about the exact opposite here, of course. Um, but you know, you guys can see that it's the same thing. I mean, you know, a penny saved is as good as a penny earned, right? I mean, it goes both ways. You know, you need to get the most with your big hands, but you need to lose the least with with your second best hands. Um, don't be like that guy. <laughs> you know, don't don't just blindly get your uh, your your aces all in uh, when, when somebody when another reg is showing extreme strength at uh, at these sticks. So, um, so in this hand here, we are on the button once again with ace jack. Uh, you guys know it looks like it's actually maybe the same table because that or actually or I'm in a different seat, but there's another guy that has the same stats here. In that seat, he is limped. Uh, you guys know that we're going to be isolating here basically all the time, so we're going to make it eight cents to go. Um, we actually do have a couple more regs at these at this table here. Um, 
So we'll kind of see how that plays out. The one sort of maniac uh, recreational player is already folded. That's villain 13. Um, so, okay, so an extremely tight, like crazy, ridiculous uh, super net. I mean, the guy's playing 9% of his hands on a 6-max table. Um, he calls out of the... Um, uh, out of the big blind here. So uh, we're going to assume that the rec player... Oh, he actually folds. Wow, that's crazy. All right, so we hit our top pair here. Now, it's really, really important. This is why I talk about player type all the time, is to understand who we're up against here. Okay, we're against, like, the tightest guy on earth. Like, this guy is playing... This guy's playing... 9% of hands is tight for full ring. That It's crazy tight for full ring. And we're at a six-max table here. So this guy is just... It's ridiculous. Like, they're... There, he should be. You should be playing double, at least at six max. Um, so the thing is, we need to Im immediately put this guy in a, an extremely strong range. We can also see that. Well, it's only 33 hands that we have on him, but he's never made a three bet. He's also only raising with three percent of hands, so he's an insanely passive player as well. So. The trouble with this spot here is that it's really going to be hard to get a whole lot of money in the pot and have him call off with worse because really when you especially when you look at this board does he even have a worse ace in his in his range do you think a 9-3 player is even playing ace 9 obviously we can't beat ace king ace queen or ace 10 um but he does check to us now with that said that doesn't mean we shouldn't bet of course i mean we should bet to just take it down i mean it's just it's a reminder that in this spot it's unlikely that we're going to get called by worse uh, in this spot against this kind of player type so we do make our two-thirds pot C bet, and he decides to call. So once again, immediately sort of alarm bells should go off there. What on earth can this guy possibly have? Um, other than like a king, queen of hearts, it's really hard to see this guy continuing with a whole lot. Um, you know, if he decided maybe to flat with, with queens or something pre, um, it's possible he has a, has a hand like that or jacks as well that he doesn't want to give up yet. We know that he doesn't three bet, so, you know, maybe he just flatted with those hands pre-flop. Um, but you can see, you know, as we talked about, there's so few hands that this guy should have in this situation that, you know, alarm bells really need to be going off at this point. Um, so we get a, you know, real super blank. I mean, the, the biggest blank you, you can possibly get on the turn, and he checks to us once again. So this is really the most crucial point in the hand, I think, and really the most, the part that I really want to explain to you guys the most. And, it, you know, I've been building this up all through this hand. So, so let's really think about what this guy can have here, you know. We think that maybe, maybe he can have a king, queen of hearts, or, or, or a queens or jacks from time to time. But guys, that's, you know, it's a very, very small part of his range. Um, he's probably going to fold either of the, any of those hands if we put another penny in the pot. Uh, maybe he'll call it the, the king, queen, I guess, of, of hearts with his draw. Um, you know, everything else is going to fold. Um, the rest of the hands in his range are some sort of ace that beats us. Um you know, perhaps a, a set with, with tens or sixes or something that he's just, you know, slow playing. So, you know, I think a lot of people would just sort of go ahead and, and barrel in this spot and go, oh my god, I got I got an ace, I need, I need to bet to, like, protect my hand or something. That's just not a good idea because there's there's nothing we're getting called by here. You know, th there's no there's no worse hand that can possibly, with this kind of player type, that can possibly call us on this turn. So even if, you know, I'm somehow giving him a free card in, in a few cases, like maybe his two outs with his, with his pocket queens or, or his, uh, his king queen of hearts, I would rather give him that, those cards just to try to get some value on the river. By betting on, on the turn here, I accomplish nothing. Um, so I would much rather just uh, check behind, which is what I do, and... Um, so we do get a uh, a blank on, on the river. So let's see how this plays out here. So he decides to come out with a bat. So what do we do in a spot like this? Okay, well, I think that, you know, most people would probably just call here, and, and I'm of that agreement. I think that the way that we've played this hand, that there's absolutely nothing else to say here, that uh, our hand is underrepped, of course, um, and, you know, it's possible he's making some silly bluff here with queens or something. We can see his aggression factor is four, so it's possible he makes some silly bluff with pocket queens or even a king-queen hearts or something. We've been talking about those hands a lot. Um, 
But there's clearly, clearly no point in raising here. Raising would be just be the worst mistake of all because, again, we're never, ever getting called by worse. So it's just, what's the point, right? All we're doing with a raise is folding out all his bluffs and getting snap called or re-raised by all the hands that beat us. So um, a raise here would be a terrible idea, but folding would be bad as well because we've severely underrepped our hand and you know we still have the you know a great bluff catcher for sure so uh so we do indeed make the call and uh he does show up with ace king so i hope that these two hands were illustrative for you guys um you can see that you know when you're playing the game like this there, there's just you're going to crush it you know look look at what we did in the first hand here we got the absolute maximum value out of our hand there's no there was nothing left in the stack for us to get whereas if you look in this hand we lost the absolute minimum against this player here and that's really the entire point of poker is to get the most when you've got the best of it and to to lose the least when you've got you know the the worst of it right so Really focus on the player type that you're up against at these stakes and just look at ranges, um, you know, when you're in a marginal spot like this and ask yourself, is it really worth playing a big pot, um, you know, considering the player type and the action and everything like that. And, you know, as I harp on all the time with your big hands, your, your two pairs, your sets are better, especially at these stakes with these calling stations everywhere, make sure that you are fast playing and getting all that money in the middle and not leaving a dime in their stack at the end of the hand. So I hope these two hands were instructional, useful for you guys. Um, I'm always putting out new videos on this channel. Make sure that you're subscribed and make sure you go check out my website as well, blackrain79.com, as I'm putting out weekly strategy uh, articles on the micro stakes there as well. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. This has been Nathan Williams with blackrain79.com.